my machine. Okay, got it. we're good. All right, now I got to find my program again. Right here. Oh, there it is. Full screen. We okay? Okay. Yes. Are we good to go? We are. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, we're going to talk about owls uh, tonight. It's particularly appropriate, it seems, because I just returned from visiting my daughter in, who lives in Ottawa. We went to Amherst Island and found sawed owls. And in Ottawa, we, we came across a northern hawk owl and some snowy owls. So owls are um, on, my, on my mind quite a bit right now. If we could go to the next slide, Terry. Okay, so what I've done is we'll, we'll deal a little bit with um, some general things about owls, some, some historical facts and some, some uh, aspects of their um, morphology. And, um, uh, and then we'll go on to um, some of the, the owls we can see around here and uh, talk about the, the various aspects that uh, we can expect to uh, to find here in Southern Ontario. So owls have been prominent in folklore, mythology, and popular culture, generally because they're nocturnal creatures and we tend to associate uh, creatures of the night with, uh, with mystery and often um, evil uh, uh, connotations. And in ancient religions, the devil was supposed to come out at night once the, the bright light of daylight uh, disappeared. So, it's interesting to see that in, in a biblical context, owls were considered unclean um, as opposed to the ancient Greeks who revered them. The Romans thought they were bearers of bad tidings and the ancient Arabs, the souls of spirits who had died unavenged. And in Africa, they were associated with witchcraft and sorcery. And Native Americans, it all seems to me, had the greatest uh, insight into owls. They thought owls gave them vision and insight. And certainly the vision of owls is um, far superior to humans. So it wasn't a bad conclusion that the Native Americans drew. We could go to the next slide, Terry. So the question becomes, what do owls eat? There are, you know, tiny little owls in the, in the southwestern desert called elf owls, which are barely bigger than a house sparrow. And there are owls the size of great horned owls and Blakiston's fish owls and snowy owls, and obviously the diet, it will vary according to the, the habitat and the, and the size of the owl. But if you take all the owls collectively, there's not very much that they don't eat. They're pretty opportunistic. They'll feed on live prey. Some of them will feed on carrion if they have um, half a chance. And I think of the, um, the owls that we saw that I saw this past weekend, the little saw white owl is feeding on primarily small, small rodents like meadow voles and forest voles. The snowy owl is taking um, larger rodents and waterfowl and the northern hawk owl is, is, um, is eating rodents. So um, they certainly have a very eclectic diet. So next slide, Terry. So we look at some of their prey. On the left is, uh, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with the Black Saddlebags uh, dragonfly. Dragonflies are a really uh, nice, uh, juicy package of protein and fat for, for an owl. And many owls, like, like um, uh, elf owls in the, uh, in the southwestern desert and western screech owls, for example, feed primarily on insects. There's a little deer mouse um, off to the right highly favored by sawed owls and um, boreal owls, um, other, other small owls. I should point out too, that most of the pictures here are taken by either myself or my wife. So there's nothing really too exotic here, nothing that you can't uh, see uh, for yourself. This little deer mouse used to you know, come around in our backyard regularly. And we told him, as long as you stay out of the house, we'll remain good friends. But if the moment you get into the house, then we may not uh, be friends any longer. So the next slide, please. So here we have meadow voles that are uh, you know, a favorite prey for, for small owls. And also 
I always think it must be an awful life. From the moment they're born, foxes are trying to get them, coyotes are getting them, skunks, raccoons, owls, hawks. Uh, every time they come out, they're susceptible to be taken by, by somebody. And around uh, this area, uh, great horned owls seem to greatly favor small cottontail rabbits. And uh, they can, they can uh, control the population you know, fairly efficiently. So the next slide, Terry. And here we have the more unusual kind of prey. This is a pine marten up in Algonquin Park. And you think of pine marten as a, an efficient predator of other organisms and, and including birds and their young and their, and it certainly is, but great horned owls will take pine martens readily. This is a mink. Again, a very, very efficient predator will take down rabbits and hares that are larger than itself, but it is no match for a, for a great horned owl. I just read, an, well, just um, probably six months ago, I read an interesting article where a fellow mathematically uh, calculated the 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 um, aggressive strength of certain organisms, and his conclusion was that pound for pound, a great horned owl was the most fearsome predator in the whole world, and that if an uh, if a lion had the capability of a great horned owl, it would take down elephants. So, mink are no match for a for a great horned owl. Next slide, Terry, please. And again, skunks, great horned owls are renowned for taking skunks, doesn't matter uh, the odor. And uh, domestic cats will easily fall prey to a great horned owl. And when I see some of the, you know, the feral cats and the stray cats that are permitted to roam around my own neighborhood, I'm always rooting for the great horned owl or the red-tailed hawk to come and take away some of those cats. We had a, we had a, um, a nest of goldfinches fledged in our backyard last year. And one of the little little babies on its first flight flooded out of the nest down to the ground before we, either my wife or I could grab it, the neighbor's cat got it. So, um, you know, if you have cats, keep them indoors, please, because they, they prey on a lot of songbirds. So next slide, please. Raccoons, young raccoons are, are taken by, uh, by great horned owls and even barred owls will uh, will tackle them. Bats are a favorite uh, favorite food of um, of a variety of uh, of owls. Next slide. So see, I want to go to the next one too, please. So these are some of the adaptations that make owls unique and help owls to survive, and some of the. Um, the uh, the aspects of, of owls that fascinate all of us. It always seems to me that amongst birders and naturalists, owls are the most sought after species. Primarily, I think, because they're nocturnal, they're hard to find, but they certainly have adaptations that make them extremely special. Go to the next slide. Eyesight. Eyesight is a phenomenal part of owl success. They can see in very, very poor light. The, the, the relationship between human eyesight and, and the eyesight of an owl varies according to the species, but on average, the, um, the, the eyesight of an owl is about eight times more acute than the eyesight of a human. And within their eyes, you have rods that, 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 that help with visual acuity and cones that help with color differentiation. They specialize in large numbers of rods and sacrifice some of the cones because they don't really need to have good color definition when they're nocturnal hunters, but they have tremendous um, um, visual acuity that enables to, them to hunt in almost total darkness. So, next slide. Hearing is also extremely acute. Um, owls have off centered ears on each side of the head. The, um, the ear is offset, so they get a kind of uh, sonar effect as they receive sound into their ears, so they can echolocate on a species just based on a you know a, a mouse just rustling in the undergrowth will be targeted precisely by by an owl that is hunting it. They have um, a facial disc which channels the hearing into their into their ears, and some of you may be familiar with experiments that have been done with barn owls where they can, they, they can actually um, zero in and unerringly pick off a mouse in, in total darkness just on the basis of, 
of hearing it. So next slide. And they have everybody has seen an owl rotate its head, I'm sure, if you've ever been out, and I'm sure you have, watching snowy owls, you'll see them rotate their head 270 degrees. One of the reasons they have to have this adaptation is that their eyes are so big in relation to their to the, the cavity of the skull is that they cannot rotate their eyes. They cannot look sideways the way, do, the way that we do. So anytime they have to look sideways or look behind them, they rotate their head completely. Next slide. And silent flight. You know, anybody's ever heard a morning dove take off? You hear that really, really loud, loud sound as they, um, as they uh, lift off. If you've heard a flock of common golden eye go over, you hear that wonderful little kind of musical sound to their wings fluttering. Owls have a, a unique um, uh, uh, set of soft downy feathers at the end of their primaries and secondaries, which muzzles the sound of their flight. So when the owl is coming in onto that uh, mouse or rat that it's targeting, the mouse or rat never hears the owl coming and never knows what uh, what hit it. So silent flight is a very important component of owl morphology. So next slide, please. And hook beak and sharp talons. Obviously, if you're taking live prey, you've got to have some weaponry to, uh, to mm -hmm. deal with it. So they have um, extremely sharp talons and a, and a hook beak, which is used to, um, you know, with larger prey, tear their prey apart. And, uh, but with smaller prey, I'm sure you've all seen pictures of owls swallowing a, um, a rodent hole, but um, they have the, the, um, the armor that they need to, uh, to deal with, um, you know, ripping apart um, larger prey like skunks and rabbits and large rats and that kind of thing. So next slide, please. So here we have like a view of, of, of the owl's eyes, you see these enormous eyes. I mean, they really are enormous. Look at the, the relationship between the eyes in your own head and the eyes in, in this owl's head. And you can see that, um, you know, they really are large and they're fixed in, in position. So they have this right and left monocular vision. So they can see very clearly either side of them. And they have binocular vision in this, in this central part of their, of their vision. In a human eye, um, we have a, 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 a center of vision called a fovea, and we have a, um, it's called a fovea lateralis. We have one fovea, but an owl has two. It has a fovea centralis and a fovea lateralis, which concentrates light onto the retina and uh, gives it a phenomenal binocular vision of, of anything it's looking at. Next slide, please. Hearing, the same thing you can see here. The, the, this is the ear cavity. Um, and you can see this one, the one on, on, on the right of your screen or the left of the owl's head is lower than the, than the, than the ear on the other side. Very, very large auricular cavity. And, and the sound is funneled into there from different, different angles and different directions. And it becomes like a, effectively like a Doppler radar. They can, actually isolate their prey with great precision and know exactly uh, where it is. Many people have said to me over the years that, that you know, they say birds don't have ears. Of course, the ears, you know, when we think of a, of a long-eared owl, for example, the ears on top of its head are only erect feathers. They have nothing to do with the actual ears. So inside the, underneath the feathers that cover the auricular portion of the owl is a flap of skin that, 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 that seals it off. Um, but owls have, have ears just like we do. Our ears that we see, the thing on the, on the, on the side of our face and, and the lobe and is just the, the external part of the ear. All of the mechanism is down inside the ear canal with the eardrum and so on. And it's the same, for, the same for owls. And you can see on this diagrammatic, diagrammatic um, uh, schematic here how, how the the sound mm -hmm. from a pinpointed prey is directed in different fashion into the lower and upper ear cavity. So 
you, you, I don't know if you've ever seen a great gray owl go after its prey in, in deep snow. I mean, it, it's sitting on a branch. It hears a mouse rustle under the snow, sometimes as much as 18 inches under the snow, and can unerringly fly from that branch, land in the snow, and with its talons, pick off that, that mouse. So it's a, just a really phenomenal attribute that, that owls have. So the next slide. And the rotating head is this, this is a barred owl looking right over its back. And uh, I've even um, taken people to see an owl and they find that a little disconcerting. And I thought the, the cartoon here was pretty good. Would you please use your rear view mirror? You're freaking me out. So owls, <laughs> when, when you see an owl, you know, it reminds you of that, uh, what was the movie, um, Exorcist? Yeah. Uh, it, it's pretty, pretty interesting to, uh, to see that, particularly for people who have never seen it. So the next slide. And the silent flight I mentioned earlier, they have these minute um, fringes along the edge of the, of the primary and secondary feathers, the flight feathers, and it totally muffles the sound. And again, if you've ever had the good fortune to, um, we, we actually had this experience on Sunday when a Northern hawk owl in Ottawa left, it was perched high on top of a very tall spruce tree, flew down, right over our heads and nailed a vole in the snow behind us and left its imprint on, on the snow. And that owl went over our heads and we didn't hear it at all. So the feathers are very effective at, um, at uh, subduing noise. So next slide, please. And the hook, uh, hook beak and sharp feet we talked about, you can see the talons on these, on these owls are very, um, very strong, very prominent. I, this guy here, whoever was holding this owl was a brave fellow. I wouldn't want to hold one like that because they can sink their talent into, into you so quickly. You see this very prominent hook bill, uh, which is used for, uh, for tearing flesh. And uh, even, um, when, you know, for the owls that swallow prey whole, when they have young, they, in the early days, they have to still, you know, tear the flesh apart and feed it to the, uh, to the young in, in in small increments. So next slide. Nope. You're going the wrong way, Terry. Yep. There. Okay. So as you probably all know, owls that swallow their prey whole have certain components of the, of the, um, generally there's, there's small mice that they're swallowing or small rodents and they cannot digest. They don't have, um, the right kind of enzymes in their digestive system to digest the bone or the fur or um, any other uh, chitinous parts. So what they do, they, they form a bolus called a pellet of, of the various indigestible components and expel that pellet um, periodically. And it's a great exercise. If ever you're interested in doing this, I've done it and it's, it's educational. And it's not really that difficult. You need a couple of, you know, if you're not really familiar with mammal anatomy, you need a couple of textbooks, but it's fairly simple to unpack one of these pellets and you find the skull of a rodent or a shrew or a mole or a bird. And you can see they're, they're quite different. And similarly, you go down the various you know, bones that are part of the structure and you can very quickly assemble the prey that the bird has been, has been targeting. It's quite, it's quite an interesting exercise. <coughs> I know a, a friend of mine who's a biology teacher has his uh, grade 12 students do this uh, annually. He always asks us if we have owl pellets that, or if we find owl pellets to collect them for him. And he gives them to his students as a project. So pretty interesting stuff. Next slide. So now we're going to look at, if you could just go back one, Terry. Back one? Um, yeah. Sorry. It's OK. So we're going to look at, as I say, primarily what I've, what I've taken are, are owls that I have seen. Every owl in this picture I have seen, and most of the pictures I have taken. And they're owls of Eastern North America that you can see locally, with one exception, right at, right at the very end. And uh, they're just interesting that um, people will even, 
you know, fairly experienced birders will say, oh, I've only ever seen one owl or I've never seen an owl. Little Eastern screech owl, this, there's a trail right behind my house. And this little e Eastern screech owl and his mate were in the same dead tree. It wasn't the same owl, obviously, but there was an, this hole was occupied for years until I live in, in Waterloo, until the town of Waterloo in its wisdom took the tree down. I have no idea why they took it down. It posed no hazard to anybody. Had it fallen of its own accord, it, it would have cleared the path by at least 20 feet. But in any event, they did take it down and I lost this, this reliable, um, mm. delightful little cavity nesting owl. A screech owl, probably most of you have seen a screech owl. The, the most, it comes in three color morphs. The gray morph, which you see here, which is the most, most common uh, color phase in, in, uh, in northern <coughs> deciduous or mixed coniferous forests. The red morph, which you, you can go to the next slide now, if you would, Terry. The red morph, um, which is far more common in, in the southern United States, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, down, down, uh, down in that way. But the little owl I showed you in the previous slide, um, there, there were two owls in there. They bred in there. And one was a red morph and one was a gray morph in the same pair. And you can see this is a little gray morph screech owl that was in a, um, a tree at LaSalle Park in, in, um, in Burlington for years and uh, would come out on a sunny day in the winter and, and sit at its hole and, and gather some sunlight. They do that primarily. Um, owls, like uh, every other bird, has little ectoparasites. And if they can get some strong sunlight into their feathers, it helps to uh, dislodge some of those um, some of those ectoparasites. So, little eastern screech owl is an owl that's fairly accessible to most people. Every little woodlot of about a hectare or two has probably got a an eastern screech owl in there. Uh, they're difficult to find because they they roost in their cavities uh, during the day, but they do come out, and they're very prone to occupy nest boxes. So we have a um, a farm in St. St. Agatha, where I'm doing a lot of uh, restoration work now, we have uh, five screech owl boxes up, and there are three of them have screech owls in. So, oh, yeah. next slide, please. Barred owl. A barred owl is a uh, you know a fairly common owl. Most of you have probably seen. It's an owl that's extremely confiding. Once you find one, they'll generally hang around in the same area for for you know weeks on end, and they're pretty confiding. They'll they don't seem to be spooked too much by by humans. They'll kind of look down on you, and and uh, it's a very uh, uh, magnificent owl. It, it's the kind of owl that most people who have no no real knowledge of birds conjure up when they think of a kind of textbook owl. It has that really distinctive um, call which anybody can recognize. I'm one of those people that you know I have to relearn all my warbler songs every year, and I don't have that. I have a good friend of mine, a, a fellow bird. He has a kind of, uh, the kind of brain that when he hears a bird song once, it's just tattooed on his brain forever. I don't have that, but a barred owl is that, who cooks for you, who cooks for you? And it's very, very easy to recognize it. And once you've heard it, you don't, you don't uh, forget it. It's a very um, eclectic feed. You can see it, its main diet, mice, rats, and voles, and shrews, but it'll take a squirrel, a rabbit, and occasionally other birds. And and uh, I've actually witnessed it once take a fish. So the, the, it's pretty. It's a pretty eclectic owl. It's interesting that um, we have a, a a young friend of ours named named Tracy Rayner. She wouldn't mind me telling you her name. She's a member of our naturalist club and and has only been a birder for three or four years and had not seen a screech owl. So I took her to see a screech owl in Bechtel Woods, a local area. And she went back the other night to see it. And uh, she was very excited because while she was watching the screech owl, a barred owl came in and took a squirrel right in front of her. So <laughs> a pretty exciting thing for her. So the next slide, please. It's just another shot of a barred owl. This was in a local, we were actually burning in Hillside Park in Waterloo this morning. And uh, this is a reliable winter location for barred owl. There's been a barred owl there every year for the past I don't know, six or six or seven years now. 
we have another reliable spot on the Mill Race Trail in, in St. Jacobs, but these are truly, truly magnificent uh, owls. So I hope you all get to see, if you've never seen one, I hope you get to see one. So mm -hmm. next slide, please. This, this is an owl we saw on Sunday at Amherst Island, a really uh, great area. This is a tiny little owl, a Northern Sawwet owl. It's absolutely adorable. I mean, they could make fluffy toys out of this and I'd buy one for God's sakes, you know, it's just <laughs> such a, such a, just a beautiful, beautiful little owl. It's so tiny and it sits there on a branch and looks at you and is, is, is very confiding. Uh, doesn't tend to move. You can actually, if you find one uh, roosting in a low conifer, like a, you know, a cedar six or eight feet high, you can literally, I don't advocate you do this, but I must confess I have done it. You can, you can put your hand in slowly and actually get under its feet and pick it off and bring it out and look at it and put it back. And it, it's just a, an incredibly uh, beautiful little creature. The, um, it's the kind of owl that, that gets people, you know, my daughter, I was birding this weekend, just pardon my little personal anecdote, but I was birding with my daughter and my grandson. So we had three generations of birders in the, in the same family. And my daughter, when she was little, would go birding with her dad, mainly to humor him. But the first time she ever saw, it, ever saw her saw at all, when she was about 16, she was hooked. And she's been an avid birder ever since. So next slide, Terry, please. Just another view of a little a little sawwet owl. It's just um, just such a and you know a really endearing little little creature. So next slide. <clears throat> You'll note along the side of all of these uh, pictures, I have some information on these on these owls. I don't, I don't you know you you all know how to read. I don't. There's no point for me to go down this item by item and read it. But this is the great horned owl. This is the most um, just look at it. I mean, if you saw that thing looking at you, you'd it would make you nervous for God's sakes. It looked like it would rip your head off at a moment's notice, you know. But they are. Look at the bill on it, you know, and the, these eyes are just so large and piercing. And it really is a, an absolutely fearsome, fearsome uh, predator. And um, it it can, uh, you know, wreak some serious havoc on. Uh, on local populations of things like uh, like rabbits, you know, and it'll. This is the owl that is most mobbed by crows. If crows see one roosting, they'll do all in their power to get it to move because they know at night it will come down and pick pick the young out of their nest or pick them off their nest when they're incubating eggs and things. And there's a there's a webcam online last year or the year before I can't remember at Bellwood Lake here in in, in this area, a pair of ospreys. Uh, nested, had two, two young in their nest, and the young looked like they weren't that far from fledging. And on the webcam, one night a great horned owl came in and took one of them, and the next night he came back and, and uh, took the second one. So they are, mm -hmm. they are fearsome predators. So next slide. This is a great horned owl in flight. Um, again, very graceful. You see this, this really large owl um, two and a half to three pounds. It's a it's big for a bird and in, in silent flight uh, across a meadow. So, next slide, Terry. Short-eared owl, fairly common, not always easy to find. No. Uh, the great thing is when once you find one, you generally find several because they they tend to uh, roost together in, in colonies. This kind of field with long grass and things is a is a favorite kind of roosting area. We have two spots in Waterloo Region now where we can we can find them sporadically about half the time that we go to see them. They're there and the other half they're not. Well, they're there, they're just not visible. We, just, we, we, we don't see them. But it's, um, again, a marvelous owl to see. It's a, um, it flies like, it's, the coloration on the wings is really exquisite. This doesn't really do it justice. And they fly like a giant moth, a kind of really soft, uh, gliding, floating flight. The other interesting thing is you, you wouldn't think you would confuse a raptor with an owl, but if you look at the, 
a northern harrier, which frequents exactly the same kind of landscape, has an owl-like face, feeds on the same prey. Um, it wouldn't be the first time I've, at a first glance, confused a great, um, a short-eared owl with a raptor. Um, so just a really, really interesting, beautiful owl. Next slide, Terry. So here's a short-eared owl perched on a post. You often see them like this. They'll perch there for, on a dull day. You know, they'll be out at four o'clock in the afternoon and it's both a <laughs> diurnal and a nocturnal hunter. And this was a, just a wonderful opportunity to take this kind of picture of a short, and it was fairly close. So, you know, often they're, you know, three, 400 meters away and it's difficult to get a decent photograph. But just a gorgeous, gorgeous creature. Again, you see these prominent eyes, the, the, you know, the, the size of the eyes in, a, in an owl's head is quite a remarkable um, physical characteristic. So next slide, Terry. A long-eared owl, I find in my experience, this is, this is the hardest owl of all to find. I, I probably haven't seen a long-eared owl in two to three years. Well, not, not probably, I have not seen a long-eared owl in, in, in two to three years. They are absolute masters of camouflage. And if you find them in a tree, they elongate themselves up, up against the trunk and they blend in so perfectly. Um, they are really, really difficult to find. And I can tell you how difficult I have found them in the past. Um, I don't know if anybody here knows Bill Edmonds. He's a really experienced birder in the Toronto area. But Bill and I went out one day to a place called um, Beechwood Cemetery, just north of Toronto. And it was um, had been for many years a reliable wintering location for long-eared owls. And under a tree on the snow was a pellet that the owl had just ejected. Remember, we were talking about pellets earlier. Mm -hmm. The owl had just ejected the pellet and the pellet was steaming, was steaming on the snow. So we knew it had just been ejected. It had just come out at the body of the owl's body at, 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 at body temperature. It still took us about 10 minutes to find that owl in that tree that had just ejected that, that pellet. So a long-eared owl is, you know, it's called long-eared. You can see these ear tufts, but they're nothing to do with the ears. The owl's ears are actually right in here. So next slide, Terry. This was a long-eared owl two years ago in, a, in an elementary school, in a tree in an elementary sco uh, school in Kitchener. And that owl stayed there for weeks on, on end. And what happened? We would, we would never divulge the location, but somebody did. And you know, the story with owls is that, you know, once you... Once you tell one person, then you, he, you swear him to secrecy. But he says, oh man, I had to tell my brother, he wanted to see it. And then his brother told somebody else. So finally the owl was discovered by so many people and so many people were watching it. The kids in the school started throwing rocks at it. <laughs> that was the end of the owl. The owl obviously uh, moved on. And if I could just digress for a moment, one of the, I don't know, is anybody, if anybody's been to Amherst Island, you probably know the, there's a location there called Owl Woods, which is private property. And the owners have been very gracious over, I've been going there for something like oh, close to 40 years now. They've been very gracious in permitting birders to go onto their property. And I found as many as five species of owl in a, in a day on their property. But a few years ago, they actually closed it for two years. They had to call the the police in at one point to remove objectionable birders and people who are dedicated photographers seem to be the worst um, offenders. They actually found one guy and, and the police the, the, who's actually charged. He refused to leave the property when they asked him to leave. And he had a handsaw. And he had a handsaw so he could saw off the branches on trees so he could get an unimpeded, unimpeded view of the owl. And for him, mm. the best, the best, um, the best photograph, you know, justified any conduct. Didn't matter if he disturbed the owl. And you see people doing this with snowy owls, where they they keep approaching closer and closer until the owl flies and it's wasting energy that it should be conserving. But this owl here was a classic case where, as long as we could keep it secret, we could we could pretty reliably go down there and see it. But the moment 
a few people weakened and told somebody else where it was, and they in turn told somebody else. As soon as the kids found out where it was, I mean, how if you're a kid, how can you resist throwing stones at a bird, for God's sake? So the bird was gone. Next slide, please. Great gray owl, <clears throat> phenomenal bird, just an enormous, enormous creature. It's actually the large, dimensionally, it's the largest owl in North America, but not the heaviest. A snowy owl is much heavier. A great gray owl is basically all feathers. The combined weight of its feathers outweighs the rest of its body mass. So it's just really insulated against the extreme cold of the north where it normally lives. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there was an, an enormous invasion of northern owls that came south and there were <coughs> great grays all over the place. And uh, I actually, at the time, was living in a little town in, uh, called Woodville up near Lindsay. I had 50 acres of property. I had four great gray owls on my property. Oh, it's wow. hard, to, hard to imagine that could ever happen again. And we had, um, we met some people in, in, in Trinidad actually from Colorado who were extremely wealthy and they wanted to, to see a great gray owl had never seen one. And I said, well, if you want, I could, I, as soon as I find a couple and I, they're pretty reliable, I could call you. So we called them when they flew up and saw the great gray and flew back to Colorado. So if you have that kind of money, no bird is beyond your, beyond your reach. So the next slide, please. This is just another shot of a great gray owl. Just a just an incredibly beautiful, beautiful bird. So the next one, more great grays. This was the year when there were great grays everywhere. You, you, <laughs> you know, it was just a, an unbelievable year for for uh, great gray owls. Yeah, but you can never see too many of them. Just wonderful creatures, you know. So you really see, you know, I talked about the facial discs on owls. You really see it in a great gray. And this helps to channel uh, sound up into the auricular area. The ears are right here. Um, as I say, this is a bird that can, from that perch where it is right there, can launch itself onto the snow and pinpoint a rodent 18 inches under the snow and come up with it. It's just an incredible ability. So the next slide, the Northern Hawk Owl. I saw one of these on Sunday in Ottawa. And it always looks, I mean, it looks, it looks about the meanest thing you could ever look at, you know. Somebody told me it looks like Jack Nicholas in The Shining. <laughs> um, but again, a beautiful little owl. It's, you know, it's, uh, if, when they do come south in the winter, they tend to remain in one spot. As long as they've got habitat, shelter, and food, they, not, unlike humans, we always want to know what's on the other side of the hill. They don't care. There's food there, there's shelter there, there's a good perch and they tend to, to stay there. One of the interesting um, things about Northern hawk owls is that all, you all know that all birds have ectoparasites, you know, little fleas, little feather mites, little ear, just like your cat has fleas or humans get head lice. You know, all birds have ectoparasites. For some reason, hawk owls carry a really extraordinary load of um, ectoparasites doesn't seem to affect how they function, but bird banders will tell you it, when they hold a, um, a northern hawk owl to band it, by the time they're finished, their hands and arms are just crawling in, in ectoparasites. So why that is, I'm not sure. But next slide, please. Just another shot. This is typically how you see them perched on top of a conifer of one kind or, or another. It's the, their favorite perch and they'll scan the the landscape below them and suddenly launch themselves. This happened to us on Sunday. I think I mentioned earlier, flew right over our, our heads and behind us nailed a rodent. So next slide. Snowy owl, if you could just go back one. Oh. Go forward one. There okay. we go. This was a big female we had. There. This owl was uh, three years ago or four years ago, it was within 20 minutes of my house. And we, we used to have dinner at night. Then we'd say it's on a, on a rural road in, in, in uh, Waterloo region called Boomer Line. So we christened the owl Boomer. And we'd have dinner. We say, you want to go see Boomer? And then we'd go out and see this beautiful big female owl. She was there the whole winter. Just an absolutely 
splendid bird and uh, uh, you've probably all seen snowy it's ironic that a snowy owl is in most of the world is a mystical apparition that people hardly believe exists for god's sakes whereas here in southern ontario we can see them every winter reliably mm -hmm. so this is a, a female you all you all recognize the the heavy marking on a on a female and this was um was wonderful we could see it at will uh, anytime we we wanted we have a a friend in California who says, we send her a picture. She said, ah, you guys have been drinking, you know, just a figment of your Northern imagination. They don't really <laughs> exist. You know, she would, she would, I don't know. I think she'd wet her pants for God's sakes. If ever she saw one, you know, she'd, oh. <laughs> the next slide, please. So these are snowy owls. This is a male <laughs> off in the distance, typical male, beautiful, pristine white, quite a bit smaller than the female. And snowy owls are, as you know, on the uh, on the northern tundra, feed primarily on on lemmings, rely on lemmings and ptarmigan to uh, to feed their young. When they come south in the winter, they're a little more opportunistic. This was a, a female that was in Bronte Harbor in Oakville and had caught a mallard and was feeding. This is the remnants of the mallard here at its um, at its feet. And. Uh, there it, it had lots of lots of prey and it, you could see it look around would look for an injured waterfowl and would just leisurely <laughs> fly over and pick it off and and uh, um, stayed in bronte harbor most of the way <coughs> next slide please the boreal owl a typical um, or, or a, a classic uh, uh, owl of the north lives primarily as its name implies in the boreal forest this is the owl in Europe, it's called a Tengbaum's owl. It's about a little bit bigger than a sawwet, but not very much bigger. Extremely rare, hard to find. And uh, I've only ever seen about maybe a dozen in my whole life. Um, one of them on Amherst Island, where I was on, on, on Sunday. But if you're lucky enough to own property and have a, a, a boreal owl visit your property, they will readily take to, um, to nest boxes so you can sometimes get them to to hang around for the for the whole winter so this this picture here was actually taken at the guelph arboretum at the university of of guelph and this is my only um exception to the fact that all the other owls are eastern owls that you can see locally but this is my claim to fame i if i could if i if i may, may be permitted just a little personal information my my uh, my first wife had died, and I met my current wife Miriam, and uh, we took our first vacation together to uh, to Northern California and up into uh, British Columbia to visit a sister of hers who lives on on Vancouver Island. And I said to her, we were at uh, Big Sur National Park in California, and I said to her, "You want me to call in a northern pygmy owl for you?" And she said, "Oh, sure, you know." And I went, it's a typical little northern pygmy owl sound. And after a couple of tries, you could hear it off in the distance. And I did it again. And I said, there it is. And 20 feet above our heads was a little northern pygmy owl. So I think that impressed them more than anything else I've ever done, you know? So beautiful <laughs> little owl. It's, it's a diurnal owl. It's also an owl, if ever you're prone to, uh, to do such a thing, um, if you wanted to, um, if you were in an area, say in California, for example, New Mexico, where there's a whole bunch of songbirds you've never seen, and you can't resist the temptation to play a tape, the best tape to play is a northern pygmy owl, because they, are, they feed on little birds all the time. So all those little birds will respond to the noise of the pygmy owl and come in to try to drive the pygmy owl away. And you can you can draw in a dozen or fifteen species of small songbirds by playing a pygmy owl tape. So the next slide, Terry. Just another shot of a northern pygmy owl. Again, a gorgeous little bird. They're very they weigh next to nothing. Tiny little bird, barely, you know, like a chunky house sparrow is about as big as a pygmy owl is so i think that's it as far as i i haven't done some of these presentations since covid you know so i but i think that's the last one yeah so a final word let me let me just you know make a pitch for 
for conservation and for environmental responsibility, virtually all species of owl throughout the world are in serious decline. This, this applies not only in, in North America, mm -hmm. um, and you know, endemic iconic species like Blakiston's fish owl that breed in Kamch Kamchatka and spend the winter in Hokkaido in Japan are declining precipitously every year. Owls here are declining precipitously. Habitat loss is the principal cause. We keep building subdivisions. We keep building new shopping plazas and schools and hospitals and paving roads. And of course, every time we do that, um, owls and other species lose habitat. Um, I was talking to somebody recently and he was saying, like in, in the area here in Waterloo where, where I live, it's, they say it's overtaken the Toronto area, the GTA is the fastest growing municipality. So all of our land is getting gobbled up with housing. And he was saying, oh, it's great. Great for the economy. Great. It's great for the economy. But for wildlife, it's just a death knell. We just keep taking habitat. And most owls cannot adapt to suburban backyards. You're never going to get a great, great horned owl or a barred owl living in your, you know, your 50 foot backyard for God's sake. And they don't even build them 50 feet anymore. Human persecution still continues. Many people have still have blind prejudice against owls or any kind of bird of prey. Um, you can't, you know, if a farmer believes that a great horned owl is killing all his chickens and all the logic in the world, it's like talking to Donald Trump in the White House. You tell him all the facts and he says, that's fake news, you know? Yeah. And humans will still, are still the, you know, they persecute owls like crazy, uh, particularly, in, in the United States where everybody's got, you know, 16 weapons in the house and shooting birds is a rite of passage for God's sakes, you know, and decline in prey populations. Rodent populations are declining as we, as we take over their habitat, we poison rodents. Um, so prey population, you know, songbirds, you've all read the dire reports that in North America in the past 20 years or so, we've lost 3 billion songbirds that's another important source of, of food for, for owls. Um, public education is very important. The more we can educate the public that owls are have their place in the ecosystem and, and that a, you know, a beneficial, a healthy predator-prey relationship is important um, uh, to the ecosystem. Owls are in fact beneficial to the ecosystem. And the other thing I, I can't stress enough is that we have to, we have this, I say we in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a collective sense, we have this strange proclivity to elect politicians we know are, are or who deny climate change, who are absolutely irresponsible towards environmental stewardship. We continue to elect the Donald Trumps, the Doug Fords, the Jose Bolsonaro's, all of these people. I mean, Bolsonaro in Brazil campaigned on the fact that he was gonna, he, his actual campaign promised that he would eliminate the rainforest, not, not just cut down some more. He was going to eliminate it. And he's doing a good job of doing that. We have Doug Ford wants to pave over half of the Holland Marsh to put in another highway extension, has eliminated the, the environmental regulations on industrial expansion and so on. We got to somehow or other, you know, do we want to save 10 bucks on our taxes or do we want to invest to, to elect people that will safeguard the environment for our grandchildren? And I think that the more we, we really weigh the, the political choices we make, the healthier we're gonna be. So that's it, folks. If you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them, but uh, thanks very much for coming. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, I've been to your club twice in person, so it's great to uh, do yeah. a Zoom presentation and um, thanks again so much. Okay. I have a question for David. Yes. Yeah, you mentioned barred owls in Hillside Park. Is yeah. that in Kitchener or Waterloo? Waterloo. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I have a question uh, about the tufts of hair that are not ears. Do do they have a function or are they just, you know, breed specific? Uh, no, they're, they're or something. You know what? I don't think anybody has a really definitive answer to your question, they, they do not seem to have a function other than part of a courtship display. They tend to erect those, ear, those ears on, on, on 
in, in, in two different circumstances. One, when a male is trying to attract a female, and the other is when they're really angry. So if you come across a long-eared owl, for example, it may have its, its ears, it's, it's those erect feathers flattened down, but the moment it sees you and perceives you as a threat, you will see it elongate its body, it stretches upwards and those feathers start to come up. So it seems to be aggression and courtship. That, that, but there's no actual physical function, doesn't, doesn't help their hearing, doesn't do anything at all. So. And you see like even long, short eared owls have little, little tiny tufts, you know, and mm -hmm. yeah. very attractive features, I always find. Yes. <clears throat> Question. Uh, one species that at least nominally is found in Ontario that you did not mention is the barn owl. Right. Uh, are, there are, are there barn owls in Ontario? They, from all reports, first of all, the locations are never divulged. Uh, from, from what I understand, and I think it's fairly authoritative, there are two or three pairs right in the southwest corner of the province around Windsor. Barn owls do not tolerate winter well. The only chance that I, I've seen barn owl in California, in Arizona, in Australia, in South Africa, but I have not seen numerically many barn owls at all. The only chance I ever had in Ontario, I don't know, maybe some of you knew it, there was a birder named John Miles. John was a fabulous birder. Um, always looked like a like a hobo off the street, for God's sakes. He'd, be, he'd always be proud of, I said that, he always had half his breakfast on his shirt and things. But as a birder, there were few that, that could hold a candle to him. And one day, John told me, he said, he, he lived down near Fisherville, which used to be a great center for short-eared owls. And one day he said to me, he says, come on down and I'm gonna show you something you'll, you'll hardly credit seeing. And I went down there and he had a farmer friend of his, and if you knew John, John was nothing if not credible. And before we went, he said, I got a barn owl I'm gonna show you in my friend's barn. Hmm. And we, we went into the barn and the barn owl was gone. And he said, it was here yesterday. And that's the closest I've ever come to <laughs> a barn owl in Ontario, but they are certainly very, very small in number if there are any. And uh, you know we've had a few nights recently. We we ran a walk a week and a half ago, and when we started out, the temperature was minus thirty point five. Those kind of temperatures will kill barn owl. They're just yeah. not. They don't have the kind of insulation in their feathers that other owls have. So, barn owls are extremely rare um, in uh, in Ontario and have never been common here. So. Mm -hmm. So yeah. for. Uh, a list that I keep um, by me. You're breaking up. I didn't hear the question. Sorry. Uh, I didn't hear. Oh. Oh, what? What? Uh, I, that question is not coming through. It's somebody's internet connection is poor. Yeah. Anybody else have any additional questions? Uh, okay. Do you lead tours of Farrells or? I do. Um, I, I, don't, I don't frequently do it specifically for owls other than I run that little convoys to look for snowy owls. Oh yeah. Um, but I don't, uh, but I do. I lead um, tours regularly. I mean, last month I led about six or eight. So again, I, I heard um, Terry talking in your preamble during your annual meeting that you're always looking for new locations for an outing. If ever you guys have a hankering to do an outing in Waterloo region, I would be happy to, happy to lead one for you. Um, I don't suppose we would see much different from what you might see in the Stratford area, but it would be a change of venue, a change of landscape, yeah. and uh, 
yeah. you know, might might be of interest to you. But I lead yeah. I lead trips for Waterloo Region Nature, which is my my home club, all the time. And yeah. we go we go down to Long Point sometimes. We go into Toronto. We go to Amherst Island. Um, we over the past, you know, pre-COVID, we'd have a weekend in Algonquin Park in March. And uh, so, so, so the answer is yes, but I don't do it specifically. I am by and large uh, committed to not disclosing the location of owls. So yeah, okay. Yeah, so. All right, anyone have anything else? Okay, David, I would really like to thank you for taking the time to make this presentation to us. I found it very interesting. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, okay, I'm glad to have done it and thanks for the invitation. Yeah, and we will try to get over and go out with you. That sounds like a great invitation. Okay. okay. Um, anything, if no one has anything else they'd like to add. <laughs> We can call the meeting or have a adjourn the meeting. Okay, that looks like it then. Well, thank you everyone. Have thank a you. great week. Yeah. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good, Good night, everybody. Night, Don. Thank you. Thanks Bye. for recording that, Don. <laughs> hey. We had 31 people on our uh, meeting tonight. At least 31, Don, right? right? We had no, we were 31. 31 parties, but some are more, oh, yeah. more than one person. That's right, 31 views. Okay, I'm gonna end the meeting for everybody. So good night all. <laughs>